For the past few weeks, we've been in a sermon series examining the life and times of Abraham, our father of faith. We've been in the book of Genesis, and we've learned of Abraham's or Abram's calling by God. We studied God's covenant with Abram and the incredible extent of Abram's faith. This week, we're going to learn of an encounter that Abram had with the mysterious Melchizedek. We'll spend a little time on who Melchizedek is, but the focus of the message will be more about what Melchizedek represented to Abraham and how we can apply that to our lives. Turn with me in your Bibles or your Bible apps to Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 through 24. Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 to 24. And while you're doing that, and I hope you are, because we're going to be all over the Bible today. If you need a Bible, there's some here in this back corner. Or I'm sure that someone next to you would be happy to share theirs. I want to remind you that as Christians, we should be reading and studying and applying our Bibles regularly, daily. If you've been waiting and wondering, God, why don't you speak to me? Guess what? He did in every word of the Bible. How many of you are prone to be forgetful? <laughs> Double hands up, I see. <laughs> Me too. I'm not sure what I would do without the calendar app on my phone. Every appointment's there, every time I need to take medicine, whatever, whatever. I put it all in there, and then I remind myself uh, one hour before, 30 minutes before. <laughs> Remembering is something we all struggle with from time to time. But sometimes, a memory can be the sweetest thing, can it? You hear a certain song, or smell a certain smell of food, or some sound. It can take you right back to a memory from years past. Suddenly, we're right there back in that moment. Well, if you haven't figured it out yet, the key word for today's message is remember. Remember. Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 through 24. After Abram returned from defeating Ketiloamer and the, king, and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to an heir, Eshcol, and Mamre. Let them have their share. Amen. Now before we get into the identity and iconic nature of Melchizedek, we should briefly recap. In the last two weeks, we learned that Abram and his nephew Lot had to split up 
because their flocks and herds had become so large that they weren't able to stay together. There just wasn't enough pasture. Lot chose the easy way out and settled near Sodom. He could see Sodom. He could see there was some fertile land there, so he took the easy way out. And Abram persevered in faith and obedience and traveled past the foreboding terrain he could see over the mountains to the promised land, to the fertile area of Canaan, and flourished. Well, the five kings who controlled the region around where Lot settled decided, we're going to stop paying tribute to the four more powerful Mesopotamian kings to the north. And those kings didn't take very kindly to that. They invaded the area, they captured the five kings and their goods, and in the process they also captured Lot. When word got to Abram, he took 318 men and he went after Lot. And he routed the four kings and recaptured all the goods and people. And just after this is where today's passage picks up. And Abram meets with Melchizedek and the king of Sodom. So now that the stage is set, who in the world is this Melchizedek? Well, besides in Genesis, Melchizedek is mentioned in two other places in the Bible in Psalms in the Old Testament, and in Hebrews quite extensively in the New Testament. Psalm chapter 110 verse 4 says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And that you at that time for that writing was King David. In Psalm 110, King David is addressed as the hero and associated with the successor of Melchizedek. David couldn't function as an Aaronic priest, Aaron, the brother of Moses, the original high priest, because David wasn't a Levite. But Melchizedek is a more appropriate connection with David because he was a king priest who ruled in the city of Salem. Jerusalem, where David later ruled. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 28, it's all about Melchizedek. Verses 1 through 10, we read, This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also, king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their fellow Israelites, even though they also are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by people who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham, because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. So here it's discovered that Melchizedek is both priest and king. Without father, without mother or genealogy, eternal and resembling Jesus. An explanation of him not descending from the Levites is kind of a foreshadowing for Jesus coming from the line of Judah and not a Levite. 
And continuing through Hebrews chapter 11, uh, chapter 7, verses 11 through 28, the shared attributes of Jesus Christ and Melchizedek are uncanny. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, also explores the shared attributes of Melchizedek and Jesus while continuing the legacy of Melchizedek as being from God. Now, we can't definitively 100% say that Melchizedek and Jesus are one and the same. At the same time, we can't ignore all that they have in common. In fact, the similarities are so numerous that they confirm Melchizedek as sent from God, at the very least, and a precursor to Jesus Christ. Melchizedek is also written about outside the Bible in the Dead Sea Scrolls, where he is uh, an end-time savior who has a heritage, a celestial being who stands in the assembly of God and will judge among the heavenly ones. There would have been an awareness of these writings during biblical times. This was well known in Jewish tradition. And it is sure that Jesus was aware of this. He knows everything anyway, right? <laughs> now, throughout the Bible and, and outside the Bible, we're able to draw a portrait of Melchizedek, although exactly identifying him has proven extremely difficult. There's been four basic proposals of who Melchizedek is. One, he was a theophany of the pre-incarnate Christ which I think is the most likely. Two, he was a historical human person who typified Christ. Three, he was a Canaanite priest. And four, he was Shem, one of the sons of Noah. The proposal that he was Shem is probably the least likely. And after that, theologians and scholars kind of have a combination of all three. As one who typified Christ, God must have ordained Melchizedek. Whether Melchizedek is Canaanite, Amorite, Jebusite, or otherworldly can't be easily determined. And you can drive yourself crazy going down a rabbit hole and get your eyes off of Jesus by trying. What can be determined is that he was a messenger from God. And his traits and characteristics serve as a reminder of God's everlasting covenant with Abraham. So, what does Melchizedek represent? It is my contention that Melchizedek represents a reminder to Abram of God's covenant with him, outlined in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, which reads, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. After Abram and his 318 men rout a superpower alliance of kings and their thousands of warriors, it could have been tempting for Abram to think he did it on his own power. He's human. He could have started to believe in his own power and might. But Melchizedek quells any temptation of that with his words to Abram when he said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, Creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High who delivered your enemies into your hand. Melchizedek's priesthood is untraceable, and he is a Gentile, 
yet he is still seen as superior to Abram, given that Abram offered him a tithe. This act is indicative of paying homage to one sent from God and a reminder of God's promise that Abraham would bless all peoples on earth. Now, due to sin, humanity presented throughout the Bible is displayed as having a chronic memory problem, one we still have today. From Adam and Eve to Abraham, Jacob, and the post-Exodus Israelites and beyond, God is constantly using people and events to remind His chosen ones of their covenant relationship. The meeting between Abram and Melchizedek represents a visible and tangible reminder to Abram of God's initial covenant promises to him. Melchizedek, a physical manifestation from God and a precursor of Jesus Christ, metaphorically confirms God's covenant with Abram of being blessed, founding a great nation, and blessing all nations through him. You see, even Abraham, the first and most important developmental and theological patriarch, needed a reminder of the blessing that God had promised and the high esteem to which God held him. So what does that have to do with us today? The Bible is ripe with the word remember. In my concordance, I counted at least 36 times the word remember or one of its variants is used. Some versions have way more times it's, it's, it's in there. The Old Testament prophets were constantly reminding the wayward Israelites of what God had done for them. The blessings promised for obedience and the curses promised for rebellion. Remembering is important to God. And today, He still intimately reminds each of us from time to time just how good He is. Not just how good He is, but how good He is to each and every one of us. There's so much good to remember. It's truly overwhelming. We can tend to dwell on the negative or dwell on where we should be in Christ. I've been a Christian for years. I should be farther along. I should be up here and I'm back here. When we really need to remember where we were before Christ pulled us out of that pit. You've come a long way, baby. Remember. If I could narrow down to three key points to remember, it would be these. Number one, remember what Jesus Christ did for you. Number two, remember who you are in Christ. And finally, remember what your purpose is in Christ. First point, remember what Jesus Christ did for you. He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become His righteousness. He carried the cross to Calvary after being brutally beaten within inches of his life and finally succumbed to death when hung upon that cross he carried. But he didn't stay there. Three days later, he arose and showed himself to thousands of people. And a few short weeks later, he ascended into heaven and sat down with the Father to intercede on our behalf. All of this while we were still sinners. 
Jesus did that for each and every one of you. That you might have eternal life if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. God's love for you is unfathomable. That love is and should be the motivation for everything we do and everything we are and should be constantly remembered. Jesus gave the disciples and all Christians today a permanent reminder in the person of the Holy Spirit. And God is still reminding us today do you remember how you came to Christ? I can guarantee you it was only through being drawn by God the Father Himself. John chapter 6 verse 44 says, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. You may have found yourself in the depths of despair and God drew you to Himself and pulled you out of that pit. Don't go back to it. Remember that. You may have been sick and tired of the temporary happiness offered by this world that always disappoints. And our loving Father touched your heart and called you to Him. Don't fall back into those patterns. Remember that. You may have received an incredible blessing that could have only come from the hand of God. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. And He pulled your being into living for Him. Don't be tempted to take your blessings for granted. Remember that. And you might be thinking, the only thing I remember is how hard life is and how serving Jesus is difficult and costly. Well, so far, you've survived 100% of your worst days. You're doing great. Remember that. Point two, remember who you are in Christ. Get your Bibles out. We're going through it in a hurry. But write down these verses. They're important to remember who you are in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. You are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Stop trying to keep one foot in the world and one foot in Christ. Remember that. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. You get to participate in the divine nature. We are in Christ and He is in us through His Holy Spirit. Don't spray paint worldly graffiti over your witness to others. Remember that. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Your old nature was dead in trespasses and sins. Now you are alive in Christ. You are regenerated, renewed, and born again. Stop living just to make it to the next moment or looking for the next high. Remember that. Romans chapter 6. Verses 5 and 6. You are united with Christ and no longer slaves to sin. Romans 8, 29. You are conformed to His image. Romans 8, 1. You are free from condemnation. And you're to walk in step with the Holy Spirit, not with your fleshy desires. Remember that. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 5. You are part of the body of Christ with other believers. Start fellowshipping with them on a regular basis instead of your good time buddies. And stop conforming to the pattern of this world. I'm not saying ignore your good time buddies. Witness to them. Live it out. But don't crawl down. You, you know, if they're in a pit, you pull them out. You don't get down in there with them and wallow around in the mud. Remember that. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19. You possess a new heart. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What a promise. Remember that. Romans 8.37 You are more than conquerors in Christ. Live victoriously and not defeated. Remember that. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. You are a co-heir of all that Jesus has. Participate joyfully in His sufferings now so that you can also share in His glory to come. This world isn't heaven. Stop trying to make it so. In it, you will have trouble. But Jesus has overcome the world. Remember that. Psalm chapter 139, verse 14. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. Your worth is found in Christ and not in the opinions of others. If God is for us, who can be against us? Remember that. You are loved, forgiven, secure, adopted, justified, redeemed, reconciled, and chosen. You are victorious, filled with joy and peace, and granted true meaning in life. What a wonderful Savior we serve. Amen? <laughs> what a wonderful Savior we serve! Amen? Amen? Amen! Praise God! Remember that. The same God that gave Abram and 318 men a routing victory against a superpower alliance of kings is the same God you serve. Abram watched his covenant blessing materialize before him because of his faith and obedience, and he went from a man without a country to holding court with kings. Abram blessed Melchizedek, and the blessing was returned. Abram's actions cursed the king of Sodom, and we all know the curse that came upon Sodom and Gomorrah. God's Holy Spirit lives in you. The very same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Remember that. Point three, remember what your purpose is in Christ. Our purpose as Christians, I like to sum it up in the greatest commandment and the great commission. The greatest commandment and the great commission. If we can just grasp those two things and live them out, our world will change drastically. 
When asked what the greatest commandment is, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Definitely remember that and do it. The Great Commission, the last thing Jesus said before ascending into heaven was that we should go, or as we go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything He commanded us. If we aren't obeying His commandments, what kind of example or teacher are we going to be to those who are lost? You might be saying, I'm, new, I'm a new Christian, man. I, <laughs> how am I going to teach somebody? Mark Wise's famous five words, come to church with me. Come to church with me. Come to church with me. That's all you got to do. There's plenty of learned men and women here who can teach and disciple. And if you keep persevering in your faith, one of these days you're going to be doing it too. Remember that. Our purpose as Christians is to glorify God with everything we do, with everything we say, and with everything we think. Remember that. John chapter 3, verse 30. He must become greater. We must become less. The world will tell you to be selfish because you deserve it, right? You work hard. You deserve it. Whatever you want. Put yourself in your interest first. You're number one. What's the Word of God say? Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Are we remembering to do that? Are we doing that? God knows our culture and society is not going to remind us. The psalmist in Psalm 119 reminds us that he has hidden God's word in his heart that he might not sin against God. That requires memorization. Repetition equals retention. Are we reading our Bibles and studying it daily? Are we remembering to do that? If we're constantly reminded and reminding ourselves of these three things, what Jesus did for us, who we are in Christ, and what our purpose is, then we are more likely to walk in step with the Holy Spirit and not gratify the desires of our flesh. And those desires are always rearing their ugly head, aren't they? Always. Satan is relentless. Resist him and he'll flee from you. You have the power, the Holy Spirit. Remember that. But remembering isn't enough. We must be Christians of action. Submit to God, resist Satan, and he'll flee from you. Wonderful promise. Sounds simple. It can be tough. Read, study, and memorize God's Word and apply it to your life. Do what it says. Put on the full armor of God and stand firm. Actively. Seek ways to encourage and bless and help fellow believers in whatever way the Lord leads and enables you. 
Seek to share your faith with those who do not have the hope we have in a loving way. Not by hitting them over the head with a Bible and telling them they're going to hell because they're horrible. You're not going to save them. Trust the Holy Spirit to work in their lives in His own and good timing. Plant the seed, water it, and let God do His work. It's impossible, impossible to fail sharing your faith. Impossible. Yeah, you might get called an idiot or stupid. So what? <laughs> so what? Not you that matters. God. When, not if, you feel afraid, remember to cast your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. And strive to come to the point where you can truly, truly rejoice and give thanks to God for all your circumstances, both good and bad. This world's temporary. We have a wonderful heavenly home awaiting us. Remember that. And finally, remember these promises to you from God. He will give you rest. He will strengthen you. He will answer you. It might not always be yes. No and wait are also answers. He believes in you. He will bless you. He is for you. He will never, ever fail you. He will provide for you. Not necessarily your wants, but all your needs. He will be with you always. And last but certainly not least, He loves you dearly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for loving us. Lord, I pray that You would soften and convict hearts to surrender completely to Jesus Christ and to obey and love Him because of His love shown for us. Thank You for Your promises. If there's someone out there who is standing on the things of this world, constantly anxious, frustrated, hurt, guilty, afraid, depressed, or distraught, lost, May your Holy Spirit tug at their heart to make it irresistible to commit or recommit to you. One minute unchanged or attempting to do anything without love and reverence for you is one minute too many. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sin. Help us to love one another as you have loved us. In Jesus' name, amen.